Thank you so much, Peter and Valerie. I'm uh, going immediately further, of course, if that works. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that I've worked for some companies with these monoclonal antibodies, so don't believe me anything. Uh, but I try to uh, tell it to you as, as uh, balanced as I can. Um, we have heard this morning in a really nice talk from Witzke Fockens already that obviously these sinuses uh, yeah, have some sort of inflammation inside and this inflammation is different from disease to disease. So we have to more and more learn about the pathophysiology appreciate it because it will give us possibilities of new diagnostics and new uh, treatment. Now, this seems to be a confusogram for most of us, but honestly, the, the nucleus of it here is IL-4, uh, IL-13, IL-5, and these cytokines drive IgE formation, they drive eosinophilic inflammation. Why do we need to know that? We need to know that because that is the new biologics which will come, and I will tell you the first proof of concept studies already have been done, and we are in the process of getting large studies, phase three studies, which will lead to the registration of these drugs. Witzke already showed our uh, scheme of, of differentiation endotyping as we call it, so chronic rhinosinusitis, very simple actually, is either non-type 2 or it is type 2. Non-type 2 mostly CRS without nasal polyps, but not all of them are without nasal polyps, depending very much on where you live. If you live in, in China, if you live in Australia, you have different uh, uh, differentiations of disease in all of these areas. Here this is of course Europe, and here we have non-type 2, but we have also type 2, and that is mostly with nasal polyps and with an asthma comorbidity of up to 70%. So type 2 is related to severity of disease, to recurrence, risk of recurrence, and to asthma comorbidity. If you have that in your head, you understand, of course, that this should have some consequences in dealing with these diseases differently. In terms of medication, topical steroids do not work very much here, but they do work here. Here they are too weak and you need additional possibilities of interfering. And that is where biologics will come in, in the so-called severe type two. Of course, as was discussed this morning, we still have to look for really good biomarkers for that, but this is certainly in development. So what antibodies are there for type 2 disease, nasal polyposis, and this has been summarized in December 2015 here with an anti-IgE, omalizumab, which we all know for asthma, severe asthma patients since more than 10 years. There are studies with anti-IL-5, interleukin-5 is linked to eosinophil survival, and you see here mepolizumab, reslizumab, of these mepolizumab will be developed further into uh, currently running trials. And finally, we have IL-4 and IL-13 together. IL-4 and IL-13 regulate IgE synthesis, and they make, they are responsible for mucus production, for example. And these uh, two uh, cytokines in one you actually can target by targeting in the IL-4 receptor alpha, where both of these cytokines have to bind to signal into the cell. And this drug is called dupilumab. Now, these are small proof of concept studies. They are not yet full phase three studies, so they give you an impression, but don't start to compare results here. That is too early, we have to wait for phase three for that. But I just want to show you some highlights on what has been achieved so far. This is, for example, looking at omalizumab, where also uh, Peter Hellings uh, joined us in doing the study together with us. And you see it's a small study. Patients with all of them had asthma and severe polyposis. And we just gave four injections in most of these patients short time and we looked at week 16. What does happen after just four months? 
And what you see here is a clear reduction of the nasal polyp score out of five, five out of eight, what they had to have. This is going down by two, two and a half score points, which means clearly that the patient is much better, but it's not healed. It is uh, really better in some because there's always a spread here. But you also very nicely see that the polyps on the placebo don't show any change. And you can clearly see that loss of smell is much better on the treatment, nasal congestion significantly better, even anterior rhinorrhea, posterior rhinorrhea, and also the symptoms of the lower airways, such as wheeze, dyspnea, and cough are significantly better. You can show that these changes by looking at CT scans, and you clearly see that this frontal sinus, for example, clears up. These sinuses clear up, not 100%, but most of it, within four months. Of course, again, this was proof of concept showing, does it work? It's not the perfect situation yet in terms of dosing, in terms of timing. All that has still to be done. There are studies on the anti-R5 principle, mepolisumab. Again, a small study, just two injections. That's all, two injections. What did it bring? We had here a clear differentiation between non-responders, and that's something we have to consider in the future. Would be perfect if we could predict the non-responders. But in the responders, you see a very nice answer to these just two injections. Again, two and a half score points down. Um, and this lasted nearly a year to come back. So very clearly, very slow, but long-term efficacy of these drugs. And the recent paper uh, might get some of you a little bit uh, frightened because it says reduced need for surgery in severe nasal polyposis with mepolisumab in a randomized trial. This is the first paper where one of the outcomes was, do we need surgery in that patient? And at least after that trial, um, which is here 25 weeks, there were clearly more patients who did not need any surgery in the Verum group. And again here, the need for surgery is reduced, but also the nasal polyp score about two points down. What about the last principle, anti-ALF4 receptor alpha, which has, as you see here, a lot of, um, a lot of different targets. It, so to speak, combines the effect against two of these cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13. This study was also a little bit larger, 60 patients, 30 in each group, 16 weeks. Uh, a lot of primary and secondary outcome measures. And what I can tell you without showing you all the data, in every single primary and secondary endpoint, the study was highly significant, although there were only 60 patients in there. The polyp score goes down by two. You know that once. And of course, we have to learn, can we bring it even further down by longer treatment periods? And this is very likely. Um, you can measure that by peak nasal inspiratory flow. You have a clear reduction of the SNOT22, which is a sort of a combination of symptoms and quality of life score. And I will come to that a little bit more because this is very impressive. By the way, you see here, although the polyp score didn't change, the SNOT22 changes, so patients are responding as uh, to the placebo treatment, so to speak, but the nasal polyp score is not. And then you see here the smell after eight weeks. There is a clear increase in some patients even after four weeks. You had an increase of uh, smell uh, very early in this treatment. So smell reacts very fast to that kind of treatment. And this is looking at the patients with asthma. A little bit more effect on the uh, polyp score here. And also in the lower airways, better colon control of asthma, better uh, lung function in these patients. And here comes the immunology again. How is that done? How is this effect uh, actually achieved? It is obviously achieved by reducing IgE considerably, but also reducing chemokines. And I don't want to go into details, but what happens is that 
also eosinophils do not walk into this area of nasal inflammation anymore. So you have an effect which actually combines a little bit the anti-R5 effect even with the anti-R4 and anti-R13 effect. These medications in general are quite well tolerable. What you have uh, is a little bit of nasopharyngitis, but nothing severe, and injection side reactions, and I think the company is working on that. So how will our future look like? And this is a little bit of an open discussion at the moment. At some moment, we have to figure out whether our nasal polyp patient is either type 2 or not. If it is type 2, we have to do a different surgery, as I just told in the other room, and then you do have the possibility to, to possibly interfere with biologics. At what time point, what you do first, whether only in those patients who had surgery or not, these are things that still have to be decided. But it is very clear, if you look at the treatment of asthma, of cancer, of rheumatoid arthritis nowadays with these monoclonal antibodies, that this treatment will come and will clearly completely reshape our way of treating nasal polyposis. With that, I wish you to, uh, to invite you in our, to our course, sinus surgery course, in end of August, or for those who really like immunology, the theory in 2018, top immunology talks, um, if you like to join the club. Thank you so much. <laughs>